Hi everybody and welcome to this documentary on Timeline. My name is Dan Snow and I want to tell you about History Hit TV. It's like the Netflix for history. Hundreds of exclusive documentaries and interviews with the world's best historians. We've got an exclusive offer available to fans of Timeline. If you go to History Hit TV, you can either follow the information below this video or just Google History Hit TV and use the code TIMELINE, you get a special introductory offer. Go and check it out. In the meantime, enjoy this video. It's always daunting when you arrive in a new place as an outsider and you try and find the locations and the stories to tell. Well, it's infinitely more challenging when you arrive at a nation's emotional and spiritual center. It's beating heart. And while there, try and find the words to do that place justice. Throughout this series, I'll be taking you on a journey behind the scenes at the Australian War Memorial, one of the most significant war memorials in the world. Every nation has its story. This is our story. In the lead up to one of the most important years in the Australian War Memorial's history, I'll be learning how the First World War shaped a young nation. I've studied the Great War and written a book on remembrance, and I feel like it's my destiny to be here. It's still peppered with bullet holes that give some sense of the violence of all that was going on. This place is an Aladdin's cave of weaponry and warfare. In fact, it's one of the store sheds housing the collection of the Australian War Memorial. But like Aladdin's cave, you don't get in here without uttering the magic word. Someone somewhere said, open sesame, and here we are, surrounded by all this terrifying hardware. It's safe, it's easy to use, and its sole purpose is to kill somebody. We'll meet the guardians of priceless history. It is a sword bayonet, so that's why you've got a problem with the tight confines of a trench and a long rifle. This was the scene of some of the most horrific fighting. From Gallipoli to London and on to the Western Front, so many millions of men were cut from the tree of life. Oh, my goodness. In memory of our only son, he fought the fight, he kept the faith. I'll be talking to Australian Prime Ministers this was really the birthplace, I think, of our spirit of, of nationhood. Shockingly flawed, poorly executed. Many people suggest this is the making of the Australian nation, you know? Well, I won't endorse that. I don't wish to get into a debate with Mr Keating about something. Something like this should be above political debate. He's entitled to his view. I've stated mine. It changed our nation, it changed the Australian people. Indeed, it changed the world. The decision makers who hold the power to send soldiers to war. When I look back on my time as Prime Minister, nothing gripped me more than the responsibility involved in uh, committing young people, uh, and sometimes not so young people, to fight in defence of Australia. I don't believe it should be the soul of the nation. I don't believe war should be the soul of the nation. The powerful, untold stories behind the names on the Roll of Honour. Today, tragic serendipity, we have been informed that an Australian soldier has died in Afghanistan. What is it like to face families who have lost soldiers? For me, uh, a profound sense of inadequacy. It was a lesson about ordinary people, and the lesson was that they were not ordinary. Reading the speech made me quite, uh, quite emotional. And the families they left behind. It's just so amazing. I can't believe I'm actually holding the actual medals of my great-great-grandfather. It's as if the sadness of the First World War is like a virus, and if you handle these things, you can catch it. And all the while, the clock is ticking as the memorial races to complete its $32 million redevelopment of the First World War Gallery. 
It's fantastic you're here to see this great moment. We have separation. Well done. When completed, the new gallery will tell a century-old story. I mean, how do you do this with a lot of bits of rusty metal? To be perfectly honest with you at this moment, I have no idea. <laughs> Transporting the modern visitor back in time to a place where legends were formed. From Gallipoli to the Western Front, the Great War, in all its glory and horror, will unfold. If we don't get this right, pretty much every household in Australia is going to know my name and for all the wrong reasons. One hundred years on, Australia remembers. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. A year in the life of the Australian War Memorial, the soul of a nation. When I think about being given this kind of unprecedented access to the War Memorial, I feel humbled by it and very privileged because I'm an outsider. I'm definitely expecting to learn things about Australia's Great War that I didn't know before. Both of my grandfathers survived the First World War. They both fought. Uh, my mum's uh, dad was at Gallipoli and my dad's dad was in France. The family connection has made the, the war very personal for me. I'll be uncovering the stories behind the role of honour. Whole lives, characters and experiences reduced to names engraved on bronze. Not forgotten, but only just. The red poppies intensify the impact of the plaques. It looks like blood. Everything about this place is powerful. Uh, welcome to the Australian War Memorial. Let's show you a way down. It's always fascinating to get behind the scenes, as it were, of any museum. And museums are worlds unto themselves. You know, they have a population, they have customs, they have rituals. We have about 50 people. They're passionate, dedicated, interested in the collection, in military history, in what they do. For many of them, it's a dream job. This is my work here. The, um, these boxes that you can see are the Roll of Honour cards. And the Roll of Honour cards were how the Roll of Honour bronze panels were actually created. Found issue 24. Do you remember issue 24? It it's the totally people dedicated. and their stories, and it's the artefacts and the stories of the artefacts that are really the war memorial. Now, this is incredibly exciting. This is our most recent acquisition for the art collection. It's a painting by Horace Moore Jones titled The Landing at Anzac. Hi, kids. Are you having a good time so far? You can't tell the story of the significance and the meaning of the Australian War Memorial without meeting the people who are its lifeblood. They are the memorial. We've got a call on the radio saying we have nine little ducklings on the pond. So, uh, she, he, I'm not quite sure how it works. There were two here the other week, so they're still obviously um, talking to each other. Roland Trebesius is the memorial's dedicated groundsman. Uh, 
this is a this is a duck board. Well, this is the ramp so the ducklings don't drown. It's a it's a nice thing. It's, it's sort of the the offer of life in a place that uh, commemorates sacrifice and death. I mean, it's a very nice thing. Oh, g'day, Neil. Good, sir. How are you? Welcome back to Australia. Thank you. And especially welcome to the War Memorial. I tell you, I, I've been looking forward, probably the wrong word, but yeah. I've been anticipating this for yeah, such a long yeah, time. Yeah, I have to say, you know, just walking through the door, seeing the building, it's a, a very powerful privilege for myself, for me, you know, to come in here and see this place and these things. Yeah. Well, so I just want to, you know, to say thanks again. Well, thank you. I, I understand that. Uh, I, I can't believe that I work here every day and I'm also paid to be here. It's mm -hmm. a, an immense privilege, so I'm glad you feel that way. I just feel that, you know, there are other places around the world that, that have some of this atmosphere, but, you know, when you walk in the doors, there is a, there is somehow a sense, and you obviously just bring it with you, but there's a sense of being surrounded by ghosts in these places, because they're all about people who are absent. Yes. And they're only represented by, you know, traces and photographs yeah. and names. But somehow, you know, with human imagination, they're all nonetheless, they're represented here at least. And well, it makes they, these places special. You'll find here in Australia, on, on your journey of discovery through the Australian War Memorial, and as you look behind these, these items, these objects in our collection and the diaries and the letters and discover the men and women who are behind them, you'll find that Australians, a new generation of Australians is increasingly finding its sense of meaning and purpose and what it means to be an Australian in those stories. Just do exactly what you normally do. You guys just watch this side like you normally do. Yeah. Serbia, Slovakia, Canada, Germany, Greece, Iraq, Kuwait. In just two weeks time, thousands of people will converge on the memorial to commemorate Remembrance Day. The memorial's events team is a well-oiled machine and every detail of planning the commemoration is executed with precision. Um, where the gods have gone on spring break, um, forecast Thursday is 30, um, dropping into rain Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, we won't know till tomorrow, but you might just want to have a look at the run sheet and see if you need to, um, if there's anything that's going to benefit from adjusting around that, um, and we'll, we'll keep our eye on it as it goes. All good? Yeah. All good. See Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you tomorrow morning. Remembrance Day marks the anniversary of the armistice, which ended the First World War. Each year, a one-minute silence is observed at 11 a.m. on the 11th of November, in memory of those who died or suffered in all wars and armed conflicts. At the heart of the memorial is the tomb of the unknown soldier, the Remembrance Day commemoration will mark the 20th anniversary of the homecoming of Australia's unknown soldier. We do not know who loved him or whom he loved. If he had children, we do not know who they are. The year was 1993, and the powerful eulogy by Australia's then Prime Minister, Paul Keating, encapsulated the mood of the nation when the remains of an unidentified World War I Australian soldier were exhumed from a military cemetery in France and interred in the sacred tomb at the War Memorial. We do know that he was one of the 45,000 Australians who died on the Western Front. One of the 416,000 Australians who volunteered for service in the First World War. One of the 324,000 Australians who served overseas in that war, and one of the 60,000 Australians who died on foreign soil, one of the 100,000 Australians who have died in wars this century. He is all of them, and he's one of us. Twenty years after he delivered the eulogy, I met up with Mr Keating in Sydney. 
what was it like to attend the the reburial of that man? Did it have the atmosphere of a funeral, or was it something else entire? It was very, it was very moving. It is very, it is very moving for all that it means. Um, and so it did have, it did have that atmosphere about it. Um, uh, and uh, you know, I felt the poignancy of the moment. The central idea was that this one soldier would represent the thousands of unknown soldiers and would come back to Australia in the midst of great affection and would have the opportunity to serve his country yet again as a symbol of all that was good about it and all that the sacrifice had cost and meant. Thousands of dead soldiers in battlefield cemeteries all around the world have graves that are marked with the words, known unto God. Their names were lost, along with everything else they had once had. And those words, that sentiment, known unto God, would have mattered a great deal. There would have been atheists and non-believers, but many of the men, perhaps most of them, would have gone to their deaths believing in a Christian God and in heaven, simply because more people did a hundred years ago. This grave of the unknown Australian soldier carried the same words, known unto God. But then, in 2013, just as we embarked on our filming, that seemed set to change. To the far end, we're replacing known unto God with we do not know this Australian's name, and we never will. And at this end, we are going to have, he is all of them, and he is one of us. And that comes directly from Mr Keating's eulogy to the unknown Australian soldier, and says in, I think, a much more uh, eloquent and evocative way, exactly what we as Australians mean in relation to this man. In a tranquil bush setting, stonemason Tim Hodge chisels the new inscription. And like any sacred places, you have to treat it with respect. Just take as much care as possible, that's all I can do, uh, because it is a sacred place. Paul Keating's words are about to go down in history on the tomb of the unknown soldier. We're three days out from Remembrance Day and things are getting a little bit uh, busier and we're sort of coming into the, the final stages of planning. We don't have an RSVP for you. No, we have no information. You can have someone send it to you again if you like. At the Australian War Memorial, the countdown to Remembrance Day continues. Meanwhile, stonemason Tim Hodge prepares the inscription that will soon feature the words of former Prime Minister Paul Keating's 1993 eulogy to the unknown soldier. The memorial is just days away from removing Kipling's words, known unto God, from the tomb. He is all of them and he is one of us. Central to the vision of the memorial's founder, Charles Bean, was the hope that the place would always be free of religious symbols. And he also hoped that governments and politicians would never forget the price, the consequence of sending young men to war. And so the memorial was deliberately located in such a way that politicians looking out of their windows in old parliament house would see what happens sometimes when you send men off to battle? It was a noble vision, but the fact is politicians and others are still fighting about whether or not God and religion have any place in that building.
Whether you're religious or not, I think it's undeniable that places like the Unknown Soldier and the, and the Australian War Memorial, they are spiritual places. No matter how cynical you are, whether you had any religious feeling, I don't think it's possible as a human being to stand in those places and not be touched in some way that none of us fully understands. And it's a brave man or woman indeed that would seek to move anything or change anything. They're just sacred. Some places in the world are more sacred than others. They're just holy, and you've got to be very careful when you walk through them. The phones were in meltdown yesterday in the wake of this vandalism, and that's the only word for it. But these men and women appointed to be the custodians of our history and of the War Memorial are ready to chisel the name of God off the face of it. Like a bolt of lightning from the heavens, Influential radio commentator Alan Jones slams the decision to remove the known unto God inscription. Is the council full of left-wingers appointed by the Labour Party and God-haters and atheists? It will be total desecration and a rewriting of Australia's history. Would you have uh, suggested removing known unto God from the stone there? Well, I wouldn't have suggested any of it because it was really for the council to decide. In light of the media headlines condemning the change, as well as political and public criticism, the Memorials Council reverses its decision and rules that the words known unto God must remain. Given the controversy that, that floated but it was around done, in it was, done, it was done by the Prime Minister uh, and he admitted to it. He, you know, he, he's on the record as saying that that he intervened, um, which was, which is a, a sort of an ideological thing to do. Unnecessary in my view, but he did it nevertheless. A compromise is reached. While known unto God will remain, the inscription on the opposite end of the tomb will be replaced with Keating's famous words, he is all of them and he is one of us. I must say, like all things, uh, particularly something of such iconic importance to the nation, if you try to change anything, you've always got people against you. But I, uh, I challenge anyone who sees this to believe that we haven't done the right thing, and uh, the right thing by this man and all those he represents. So thank you very much. That's all right. It's wonderful you wonder whether a Prime Minister should intervene in such a matter um, personally. Um, I don't think I would have had I been Prime Minister and the Council have decided other things. But, of course, I get right up the nose of the Australian Liberal Party, the, the remnants of our failed upper class. Do you think the, the known unto God should be there? Well, known unto God didn't come from God, it came from Rudyard Kipling. Now, I don't know to what extent our Prime Minister or his minister, you know, genuflect at the, at, at, at the life and writings of Rudyard Kipling, but I'm not prepared to even enter the dispute. PM, good to see you, Tony. Great to see you, mate. Hi, Neil Oliver. Hello, sir. Thanks for making the time. Good to lovely, meet you. Lovely to meet you too. Good. Yeah. Anyway, it's great to be here. Yeah, thanks, Tony. I just want to hear some of your perspectives on this place, really. I've been coming to the War Memorial on and off for uh, uh, over 40 years. I would have been about 10. G'day, how's it going? Good to see you. What do you feel, can I ask you, what you feel about uh, Kipling's words. Kipling's words, well, what they did he? Kipling was a, a great poet of empire and uh, he, uh, uh, he had seen conflict up close and of course he lost his own son in World War I. Mm -hmm. So um, there was uh, so much feeling invested in that phrase. Mm -hmm. I always try to remind myself that you know, the First World War is in many ways a foreign country for all of us, you know. We, none of us belong to it mm. anymore. It mm. happened to them. Mm. Uh, and that the known unto God sentiment for me is part of that lost mm. world. 
So their life, their, their times as well as their life mm. is known unto God. Mm -hmm. Well, that's true. And yet uh, the echoes of those times uh, continue to roll around the world. And uh, so much of our world was shaped by that world. Mm -hmm. So uh, while in one sense it's foreign in that it's passed beyond the living memory of today's men and women, uh, nevertheless, uh, we are still living with the consequences of those days. What do you want modern Australians and people from elsewhere to get from this place of remembrance? Not just this Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, but from the, the whole of the Australian War Memorial. An understanding of our history, uh, an understanding of the individuals who have worn our country's uniform and therefore a better understanding of ourselves. There we go. Right. A bit more light. Sorry, moths. Are you on your own here tonight? Yep, yep. yep. Just us. Just Gee, look at the moths, Roland. It's the evening before Remembrance Day and the memorial's director, Brendan Nelson, begins his private ritual of cleaning the tomb of the unknown soldier. Were you here the day the unknown Australian soldier was reinterred, Roland? Yeah, I decided to um, sit underneath in the Hall of Valour. Did you? To welcome him, yes. I didn't need to be out there. Because the Hall of Valour is immediately below. Immediately below us, yeah. So I decided to sit there. Uh, and, um, yeah, well, that was my idea anyway. I mean, that was my uh, sentiments. I didn't need to be anywhere else. Are we allowed to call him Doug? Well, I'm told that you call our unknown Australian soldier Doug. Very Australian, I would have thought, but obviously some, to be politically correct, I could get into trouble, which wouldn't be the first time. At least as Australians, we do tend to think that we're all equal and no one's yes. more important than anybody else. All right, I'll be back in a tick. Thank you. There are people that will see me doing this that, as with everything in life, will be critical. They'll impute some motive uh, to me or Roland and, and so on, that's their business, but um, it probably wouldn't be a bad thing for our, all of our elected federal members of parliament, perhaps at some point if they wish to, to come and do this. It, it only takes 45 minutes or so, but it's quite a, it's quite a transformational experience, I'll put it that way. There are well over 60,000 names on the Roll of Honour, and every single one of those names, you have to remember, is the start of a unique story. Down here, at the bottom of the Roll of Honour are two names, Walter and Henry Whiting. They were cousins who died fighting on the Western Front. And they're significant because they share a relative, a third man, a soldier who survived the Great War. And he wrote a letter which went home and which may be our closest link to the unknown Australian soldier. Recently, a copy of the letter was sent here to the Australian War Memorial, but so far, the whereabouts of the original remains a mystery. Walter and Harry Whiting were brothers, and Henry Whiting was their cousin. Harry Whiting was a remarkable man who wrote an historically significant letter. What you're seeing here is a transcribed copy of Harry's words, and the memorial is on a mission to obtain the original handwritten letter. This letter uh, actually says so much, and I'll just read it in part. Uh, Dear Hilda, the reasons for evacuating Belgium was because 10 of us volunteered for the Graves Detachment Battalion, which is composed of 1,100 men, a few from each battalion. 
Stan, Merv and myself volunteered to assist in the raising of the bodies of our dead comrades and place them in the ground which we have surveyed for this purpose. The one which we are filling now is called the Adelaide Cemetery. The Adelaide Cemetery, by the way, is the cemetery from which our unknown Australian soldier was exhumed and then really? interred in our Hall of Memory. So, so the unknown soldier, whoever he was, had lain for a time in the Adelaide Cemetery. Correct. So you can imagine, when I first read this, that immediately uh, pricked my awareness, apart from the, the further content. Naturally, uh, we don't ever want to know who our unknown Australian soldier is, but of course it's, it's possible mm -hmm. that there is a direct link between Harry Whiting and our unknown Australian soldier. So, Whilst you're here, uh, I'd certainly be appreciative if you and your team can do what you can to find more out about it. This letter that Brendan's given me mentions two soldiers, Walter and Henry Whiten, both dead, both buried in one of the French cemeteries. I want to see what background information is available about these men. So I'm going to talk to one of the historians who works here to see what other information has turned up. So I've had a look and found the service records of these men. On the 8th of August, 1918, the Australian and the Canadian Corps make a massive advance. And it's a really important day. Um, the German commander calls it the Black Day of the German Army because suddenly the British can push them back. Mm -hmm. So they are in a phase of movement and the 3rd Battalion is moving to catch up to the front line right. to join the fight. But we have some bombs being dropped. In the memorial's archives, the final days of Walter Whiting and his cousin Henry are carefully recorded. The two men were killed on the Western Front during the great Allied advance known as the Battle of Amiens. During the early hours of the 9th of August 1918, an enemy aircraft flew over their position and dropped a bomb. The blast killed Henry Whiting outright. By his side was Walter, who suffered a penetrating chest wound and died shortly afterwards. So they signed up together, got consecutive numbers, and the war separated them, mm. and then they come back together at some point. Yeah, they're clearly back together. in the same platoon and sitting together because these bombs are not big, they're very light. The bombers are only very, very in their infancy and it's quite likely that this is a German man in a kite-like plane dropping one over the side as he went over. So they might have been side by side when they were... They, they probably were. When they were injured and killed? Yeah. It's a 25-pound Cooper bomb. It's most likely that it was a bomb like this that killed both Walter and Henry Whiting. So it's the standard British light bomb of the First World War for dropping from aircraft. This, of course, is a British bomb, but the Germans used a similar sort of a device. Senior curator Nick Fletcher is assessing the weapons which may go on exhibition in the new First World War gallery. It's basically any personnel, any ordnance, you drop it on gun positions, trenches, what have you. It's quite a simple little device. It's got an arming vein there, so it spins, winds up the, uh, the primer, the detonator, and, and away she goes. Just a, a timber back on it that's fitted in the field and the front end's the exploding bit. It's a steel shell filled with about five pounds of high explosive, so it's going to splinter this into small metal fragments and they would be lethal over a considerable distance, but um, to be killed by aerial bombs, you had to be quite unlucky. The aeroplane is flying overhead at high speed. Presumably the bomb drops in an arc. Precision aerial bombing isn't going to be coming along till the Second World War. So this is very much a hit or miss thing. To be killed by bombs is really almost a fluke. Nearly 100 years ago, a random bomb would change the course of so many lives. But the real impact of the war is truly reflected in Harry Whiting's letter. Could Harry be the man who buried Australia's unknown soldier. At the end of the war, in November 1918, Harry Whiting was among the soldiers who, instead of returning home to Australia, volunteered to join the exhumation parties. The process of recovery and identification of remains was developed for the first time after the Great War. The exhumation groups would work throughout the battlefields of the Western Front where they would try to identify bodies that had been lost, then exhume and rebury the remains.
It was here, in the French village of Villa Bretonneau, that Harry Whiting wrote to his friend Hilda back in Australia. I'm trying to imagine what it was like for Harry as this young man opened up about his experiences of reburying the dead. Today I dug two up that were buried together. One was a Tommy and one an Aussie. The Aussie's head was blown clean off and sticking in his steel helmet and stuck in the middle of the Tommy's back. We have found many cases of a similar kind. We will be a hard-hearted crowd when we get back after the sights we have seen and the many thousands we will have raised by that time. This is the Adelaide Cemetery, and it was here in this grave that the remains of the unknown Australian soldier lay for 75 years before they were finally exhumed and taken home. And this is one of the cemeteries that Harry Whiting helped to lay out. And he wrote about it in his letter to Hilda. We started on Monday last, and I can assure you it is a very unpleasant undertaking. Nearly all the men we have raised up to date have been killed 12 months, and they are far from being decayed properly, so you can guess the constitution one needs. I have felt sick dozens of times, but we carry on, knowing that we are identifying Australian boys who have never been identified. Many mothers picture their sons blown to pieces and no record. So now we hope to be able to identify 90% of the missing. We cannot know for certain whether or not Harry Whiting actually buried the body of the unknown Australian soldier. But in any event, that dead soldier has become a legendary figure. And that's not enough, because if he becomes myth, he is denied his essential humanity. He was flesh and blood, and what we can see in the letter that Harry wrote to Hilda is that he understood the real significance of what he was doing. He was taking care of and paying attention to mother's sons. My quest to discover more about Harry Whiting and his link to the unknown soldier has one final chapter to play out. Harry's powerful letter is about to lead me to his descendants. At the Australian War Memorial, the finishing touches for the commemoration of Remembrance Day are almost complete. Australia's Federation Guard! Present, on. You're just looking for the coordination of the entire group. So the sound, the sound of their footfall all being uh, at the same time, the sound of the slap when they hit the rifle all being at the same time. They're not up to scratch at the moment, but they're getting there. For us, it's all about checking the timings, making sure that the cues for the band and the MC all work. And if on the day we have to speed up or slow down the ceremony, um, we've got a small window to do that to make sure we, we hit 11 o'clock for the minute silence at 11 o'clock. As Remembrance Day draws near, I'm still on my quest to find out more about soldier Harry Whiting's letter and his possible link to the unknown soldier. I've tracked down the source who sent the memorial's director, Brendan Nelson, the copy of Harry's letter. Does the original of the letter actually exist? Is it in anyone's hands at the moment? The original of the letter does exist, and I'll introduce you to the, uh, the holder of the letter. But look, there's a great twist to finding this as well, and I'm sure he'd, he'd be happy to show you the letter. Fantastic. Thanks very much for that, James. OK, I'll be in touch. Bye, Neil. Thank you. Bye for now. Bye. Bye, then. The old gold mining town of Adelong it's just a few hours' drive from Canberra. This is the area where Walter, Henry and Harry Whiting were born and where they signed up to fight on the Western Front. Only Harry would return home, where he would remain in the district and continue working as a school teacher. Local historian James Hayes has agreed to help me find Harry's original letter. 
to come from here, you know, from this peaceful rural background and then to be transported through a door into another world. Yes, into, into mud and blood and gore and, yes. And what about the fighting family? Who were they before the war? They must have been working on one of the farms um, and they lived out not far from town, but there was 18 children in the family. 18? Yeah. What, from the one set of mum and dad? From the one mum and dad. Wow. 18? So, 18. That's a job of work. <laughs> it is. I'm bringing you here. I mentioned in our phone call that there was a bit of a twist. And the letter that was found was found at this tip. And I'm going to introduce you to the man that found the, the, wow. the letter. So he's... So he's, it's been he's, thrown away? It's been thrown away. So this, of all places, is pivotal to the story of the letter. It is. Some time ago, Peter and Elizabeth Smith made a very intriguing discovery when they were fossicking through the Adelong tip. Tell me what happened. Peter's mum and I brought rubbish down, and there was a tablecloth. I could just see a corner of it, uh -huh. down probably six a foot. A tablecloth. A ta lace, lace tablecloth. Uh -huh. was absolutely beautiful. And I said to Mum, I'm going in to get it or to see what's there. And when I got in there, there was bags and bags of stuff that I knew Peter would be interested in. Why? Because he loves history. So what was it that you could see apart from the tablecloth? This book, which is an old exercise book with cuttings and... Oh, so someone's used that. It's, a, it's like a it school book. It was a school book that they... used as a scrapbook. As a scrapbook. So what did you think, Peter, when you saw that? Well, I couldn't believe it. it. You know, there was just old cuttings. I've always been interested in the history, and mm -hmm. there was an obituary in it from a newspaper of my great-grandmother, and, right. and there was an old letter. The letter. The, the letter. The letter, yes. And have you got that as well? It's in here. It's in here. This is the letter. Wow. Is it okay if I take it yes, out? Yes, it is okay if you take it out. So this is the original of the letter. This yes, is the original. The original. Oh, my goodness, so this was sent from... Sent from that. Villas Breton now. Oh, oh, it's very faded, isn't it? It was always like that. Um, uh -huh. Oh, gosh, there it is. France. All bodies are placed separately in large bags and buried that way. For my part, I would be pleased to see them remain where they were first placed to rest. How do you feel when you read the letter? What does it make you think? Well, it, it gives you a chill up your spine it's when you think mm. about it, you know, like, what a horrendous job. It seems cruel to see them taken up in pieces and placed away. Mm. It's harrowing. So what do you think should happen to this letter? Well, I think it should be kept for posterity in the Australian War Memorial. It'd be good to see it go somewhere where it'd be appreciated and valued for what it is. That's quite something to have almost disappeared it is. into a right. landfill yeah. and then <laughs> potentially to end up on display in the Australian War Memorial. Before I leave Adelong, I have one last person to meet. Harry Whiting's niece, 86 year old Vonnie Peel. Hello, Neil. Good morning. Pleased to meet you. When Harry returned home from the Great War, Vonnie recalls asking him about his gruelling work with the exhumation parties. So, are these photographs of Harry and the brothers? Who we got here? That's Harry there. That's him there. That's him. Mm. And so, this. Is the note that your uncle made in response to your questions? Yes, that's right. It was our duty when a bo body was exhumed, and if buried as unknown, it was our duty to look through any belongings buried with them. We were able to identify over 70% of unknown that's soldiers. That's right. Now, he said he knew what his mother went through when Uncle Walter was killed, and he didn't like the thought of all the other mothers at home wondering what happened to their boys. Vonnie, how do you feel knowing that this letter made by your uncle will become part of the collection of the War Memorial? Absolutely thrilled. I'm sure the rest of the family will be very proud of it. If the story of Harry Whiting's letter was the stuff of fiction, 
it almost wouldn't work because it stretches the bounds of credibility too far. But the fact is that Harry witnessed and recorded something that he realized ought to be remembered. And then just at the moment when it might have been lost forever, when it was flung into this tip, along with the rest of Hilda's personal belongings, it was spotted by just the right person until finally it could be put into the collections of the Australian War Memorial. It's a sequence of events that absolutely makes you say, that was meant to be. 100 years ago, the horror of all ages came together to open the curtain on mankind's greatest century of violence, the 20th century. What distinguished the First World War from all wars before it was the massive power of the antagonists. Modern weaponry, mass conscription, and indefatigable valour produced a cauldron of destruction the likes of which the world had never seen. just been able to put it at his name. A very loving dad. I miss him even this far back. I still miss him. The ambition for the memorial in remaining true to Charles Bean's vision is that every Australian, whether Australian by birth or by choice, feels a connection to this unknown Australian soldier Several months after Remembrance Day, Vonnie Peel, accompanied by Peter and Elizabeth Smith, arrived to donate Harry Whiting's original letter to the memorial. Elizabeth and I would like you to take it into your collection at the museum here, uh, and from the people of Adelaide. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It's great to see it'll be preserved and looked after. after. That's right. It will be here forever. Now, I know that they're long here. The memories of fallen family members, Walter and Henry, are never far from Vonnie's heart. Now, they should be here somewhere. Here we go. Oh. Right there. Right at the bottom. That's it. Yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's hard to find the words to describe well, it, isn't it? It is. Yeah. It's a proud, very proud moment. I never thought this day would come when I'd have the opportunity to be here. It's lovely. Thanks so much. It's a privilege, a right. privilege. You're going to make me cry. You don't realise how many, you know, have given their lives mm. for us. We've made a bit of a mess of some things, yeah. haven't we? Mm, we have. Quite a lot of things. Mm. What we're determined to do, Vonnie, is that, that every one of them is remembered. Yes. That every one of them... Age shall not worry them, nor the years condemn. The going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. 
lest we forget. Every evening, the War Memorial holds a last post ceremony, and the story behind one of the names on the Roll of Honour is told. Tonight, Harry's brother Walter and their cousin Henry will be remembered. Sometime during the early hours of the 9th of August, an enemy aircraft flew over the opposition and dropped a bomb. The bomb blast killed Henry Whiting outright. Walter Whiting suffered a penetrating chest wound in the same blast and was taken to the 7th Australian Field Ambulance Dressing Station. He died shortly afterwards. Henry and Walter Whiting were buried side by side in a nearby cemetery. Henry was 34 years old and his cousin 25. We now remember Private Henry Whiting, his cousin, Private Walter Lewis Whiting, and all of those other Australians who have given their lives in the service of our nation. When you laid down the wreath, who are you thinking of? The two lads, plus all the others that went before them. There were so many thousands that left and never returned. If I was a parent in that position, how sad it would have been not to know where your boys are like. Well, at least they've got this place. That's right, it's beautiful, absolutely. 